Hello, and welcome to the Gene Tumor documentary. In the next 10 minutes, you will explore the life of the great poet Gene Tumor. Enduring numerous struggles throughout his life, he became one of the leading figures of the Harlem Renaissance. As Gene Tumor overcomes abandonment and bullying, you will be presented with an amazing insight into his childhood, family, career, and death. Although controversy surrounds Gene Tumor, one cannot deny the everlasting contribution to American literature and his legacy. Nathan Eugene Pinchback Tumor, later known as Gene Tumor, was born on December 26, 1894 in Washington, D.C. to Nathan Tumor and Nina Pinchback. Tumor was racially diverse, having both Caucasian and African American within his bloodline. In 1895, when Gene was only about one year of age, Nathan Tumor abandoned Nina and Gene to go back to his hometown in Mason, Georgia. Nathan Tumor was never to be seen again. Devastated, homeless, and with nowhere else to go, Nina and Jean settled in with grandparents in Washington, D.C. After a slight hesitation, PBS Pinchback agreed to have Nina and Jean live with him. It was not always easy for Jean at school, as he did endure bullying due to his mixed descent. In 1904, at the age of 10, Tumor had come down with nearly deadly stomach ailments, in which he suffered nausea, diarrhea, and vomiting. <laughs> After graduation in 1914, Tumor attended the University of Wisconsin in 1914 to major in agriculture. Soon after, Tumor found a new interest in physical fitness and continued on to attend the American College of Physical Training in 1916 to obtain a degree in physical fitness. Later on, Jean attended the New York College where he obtained no degree. Soon after, Jean Tumor inherited a very large amount of money from his grandparents, which made him a very rich man. In 1919, Tumor received a job writing for the New York Call, where the articles he published reflected Tumor's political and economic background. Later, he befriended Waldo Frank, who helped him publish his famous novel, Cain. The first section of Cain puts together six stories, twelve poems that use nature to make portraits of six southern women. Part two includes de descendants and survivors of the black southern culture and the post-Civil War world. Part 3, the longest section, is about an educated, confused black artist struggling to represent the parting soul of the African-American past in art. Soon after, an editor from the New Age taught Tumor the beginnings of Gorgiev's system of self-development through intellectual, emotional, and physical integration. When Tumor returned to the U.S. in 1926, he finished his novel Caracombe and continued to write novels, plays, poems, sketches, and essays. In the spring of 1931, Tumor meets Marjorie Latimer, who was a member of Oregay's New York Rojef group. Hey, Margie. How are you doing? Hey, Jean. Oh, I got to see you. Soon after oh, their meeting, you. Jean weds oh. Marjorie. How about marrying me? Um. Oh, of course. Yeah, let's go. Do you take Jean to be your lawfully wedded husband? I do. Gene Tumor was not always faithful to his wife, however, and saw mistresses in the duration of their marriage. After a year of their marriage, Marjorie gives birth to a baby girl, but at a cost. Sadly, Marjorie died, died in childbirth, with Jean at her side. Take care of our daughter, Jean. I'm sorry I couldn't be here for the both of you. Don't say those kind of things, Margie. You're gonna be all right. She's beautiful, isn't she? She looks like the both of us. <laughs> Margie, love! Margie, open your eyes! You can't leave me like this! I can't live without you! Soon after, Tumor traveled to the Southwest soon after his wife's death. 
There, he met Georgia O'Keeffe, another one of his lovers. They never married. In 1934, Toomer met Marjorie Content, the woman who became his second wife. And in the spring, he moved with his wife Marjorie and his daughter Marjorie to Doylestown. Toomer was a womanizer throughout their marriage, but Marjorie desperately wanted their marriage to work, so she ignored his unfaithfulness. Again? <laughs> Stay tuned, and we'll continue on about Jean's life after this short break. Hello everyone, have you heard the famous Harlem Renaissance poet, Jean Toomer? Well, if you haven't, know that he was a very inspirational man who wrote many inspiring poems during his lifetime. In fact, I would love to offer you a chance to purchase a complete collection of his famous poems. For only a small payment of $50, you can be one of the first to own his complete collection of pure inspiration in the form of Gene Toomer's poems, including Georgia Duff's Evening Song and many more. Full moon rising on the waters of my heart, lakes and moon and fires, cloying tires holding her lips apart, promises of slumber leaving sore to charm the noon, miracle made vesper keep, cloying sleeps and I'll be sleeping soon, cloying curls like sleeping waters where the moon Start. Radiant resplendently she gleams, coin dreams, lips pressed together. Hello and welcome heart. to the Harlem Renaissance Music Theater. Here we play music from famous composers and singers during the Harlem Renaissance, such as King Oliver, Louis Armstrong, and Bessie Smith. Come on down to the Harlem Renaissance Music Theater as soon as possible to enjoy the amazing tones of Renaissance music in a theater near you. Hello, today I'd like to offer you a chance to get to know one of America's great poets, Gene Toomer. Today, you can buy a detailed biography of Gene Toomer's life for two and easy payments of $30. This DVD includes information from Gene Toomer's birth in Washington, D.C., all the way through the rest of his life. For those of you who don't know, Gene Toomer was a man of mixed descent who wrote about slavery in a mentionable amount of his poems and is regarded as one of America's great poets today. And now, if you call in the next 15 minutes, we'll throw in a bonus DVD including extras about this amazing man's poems, including November Cotton Flower, Evening Song, and many more. Don't miss the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to learn about a memorable historical figure. Call this number within the next 15 minutes to receive the two DVDs previously mentioned for two easy payments of $30, plus shipping and handling. Hello and welcome back to the Gene Toomer Special. In 1940, Gene's wife met someone from the Quakers by incidence and agreed with their beliefs. In 1940, Gene officially became a Quaker. One year later, Marjorie's father dies and Gene again inherits a large sum of money. In 1947 to 1949, Jean was asked to write Quaker pamphlets, which included an interpretation of Friends' worship. During this time, Tuma had many medical issues, including recurring eye problems, gallbladder problems, insomnia, congestion, impeded bleeding, and kidney problems. To aid these many problems, Jean did see doctors. However, they were only able to cure him for a short time. As the years passed, Jean became more secluded from society and often shied away from the public eye as a Quaker. Hey, Jean, Jean, do you have time for an interview? I heard you had a bunch of mistresses. What, what happened to your first wife? How did she die? What kind of soap do you use? <laughs> yeah, so good. Near the end of his life, Jean was in and out of nursing homes and did eventually die of arthrosclerosis on March 30th, 1967 at the age of 72 years. As for Jean Toomer's legacy, his novel Kane was a major literary contribution, making him a leading figure in the Harlem Renaissance. This novel is also regarded as bearing characteristics previously unseen in any literature before its time. It's due to its objectivity, artistry, and stylistic approach. Because of this, Jean Toomer will always be remembered as one of the great poets of the Harlem Renaissance.